I'll take this one. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Is the mic on? Is Mike here? Right. We've got two mics, in fact. Uh, my name is Mike Butcher from, uh, that's me up there, TechCrunch, and Mike Curtis from Airbnb. Thank you very much for joining us, everyone. I hope you're having a good uh, conference. Um, we are going to talk about Airbnb and also the uh, share economy. What I think is fascinating, really, is I love the story, actually, the, the initial story of Airbnb. Yeah. Huh? Um, you know, uh, the co there was a cornflakes packet involved, wasn't uh, there? Yeah, uh, the cereal. Yes. Yeah, sure, I, I can talk about that. But uh, first of all, like, bon dia, good morning, uh, Barcelona. Thanks so much for having me here. It's, it's really exciting for Airbnb to participate in a conference that's all about innovation and entrepreneurship. That's what we're all about, uh, especially here in Barcelona. So th thanks for having me. Uh, yes, the cereal story. Well, so, just briefly. Yeah, uh, when, when Airbnb was first starting out, it took, it took a little while for it to get off the ground. You know, like, when you're building a marketplace, it takes a while to start getting, like, the supply and demand built up and actually get things going. And so there were some dark days in the early parts of Airbnb where it was getting off the ground. And at one point, the founders realized that, you know, they had accumulated some debt, they didn't have enough money, and so they came up with this idea, it was around the presidential election time, uh, to package cereal boxes that were, you know, kind of funny and branded with, you know, McCain flakes and Obama O's, and then sell them as a novelty. And they did that and raised um, many thousands of dollars that enabled them to keep Airbnb going. And so that, actually, that whole story ties back to this concept, one of our values of serial entrepreneurship. Like, <laughs> when you're faced, that's what we call it, that's our value, serial entrepreneurship. When you're faced with real adversity, you have to get creative. You have to think of something that can really push you through. Do you think that, the, that people have forgotten those days when you could, um, when raising money was about going out and raising some actual cash rather than getting investment? Um, well, I, I think that you know, capital can be a little bit more easy to come by uh, these days, uh, maybe than it was then, but I think particularly for uh, Airbnb, the idea sounded so crazy, like this idea of staying you know, in other people's homes that it might have been even harder for them to raise capital early, so they had to go out and actually find yeah. the money to keep it going. Do you think that, I think what's, what's been exciting to watch over the last few years is, is a rise, of course, as what we, know, we call the share economy. Mm. Now, at Airbnb, you must think, think about this a lot, about whether or not there's a limit to where you can go with this. Uh, you know, you, you, because you're now moving into other areas such as the corporate uh, accommodation market, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, business travel. Yes, now, uh, perhaps you'd like to unpack that a little bit for us, but uh, I, just generally, what do you, th do you think there is a limit, or uh, will it, we eventually just rent everything out that we own virtually? <laughs> well, I think that, at, at least in my view, the, the sharing economy and the idea of sharing is still very early. Right? This is a relatively new concept. And so I think that we're at the very beginning of what could potentially be possible with it. I think we're just starting to figure out what uh, verticals you can apply sharing to where you know, it can be valuable. Um, I think that, yeah, the, the potential for where it could go, I think it's sort of, think about the, the situation in the world today. There's all these people out there who are qualified and capable and can do things who can't find enough work. Right, and need a little help making ends meet, and I think that you know the sharing economy is an opportunity to help tap into that to people who you know have good skills but can't find the work that they need to, and enable them to become micro entrepreneurs. Right, like when you think about Airbnb hosts, it's a whole community of micro entrepreneurs, and what they're doing is you know taking advantage of the assets that they have to earn some extra income. If you think about just how powerful that is and how much incentive there is behind that, I think that you can take that kind of model and apply it to lots of different potential verticals. But uh, let, me, let me just add one other point. Sharing economy is fairly new, right? And it's a new idea. And as soon as a new idea comes out, what you start seeing is you try to solve every problem with that new idea. So over the next few years, I think we're going to see 
tons and tons of different sharing economy companies pop up. Uh, there's some really interesting ones out there right now that are all working in these different verticals. I think some of them are going to stick and be great, and some of them probably won't. So we'll see how it plays out. Um, there's been lots of controversy around companies like Uber and, and their battle with regulators. And Airbnb has also been through its fair share of trials on that regard. Uh, I remember at one point they were going to ban you from Berlin. Right. Um, and I'm not, where are we on that, by the way? Uh, I don't know Do where remember? we stand up we'll have to right check. now. Yeah, but, we'll check. But, but I mean, um, I mean, obviously, it's not necessarily something that uh, is in your, your next sphere of the company, but just generally, when you feel that, uh, that do you think that we, we're going through a, a dialectical uh, conversation with regulators about the share economy? Mm. Uh, um, to, should, should we just push back on that, or do you think there should be more dialogue between regulators and innovators such as yourselves? Well, I think that... First of all, we're always working with local governments. We're always working with officials to try and do things the right way and in a way that's beneficial to the cities in which we operate. Um, I think that what we're seeing is, you know, again, like I said before, sharing, it's a relatively new idea, right? And so you take a new idea and then you put it into a place that has a legal structure that existed before that new idea existed and you're bound to run into like some edge cases and things that need to be worked out. Um, I think that sharing is this incredibly positive thing where we can make more efficient use of our resources, right? You can use your unused space uh, when you don't need it, like you can rent out things that you own that maybe somebody else doesn't need to buy. There's all these like positive side effects that can come and economic benefits that can come from it. So I think that long term the regulatory landscape is going to look pretty good for us, but you know, we have to figure out all the details through that um, working with officials. If I was a hotel chain, I would, would be um, more concerned about uh, the threat from Airbnb, especially now that you're moving into the, the corporate world. Um, isn't that, uh, is that something that you, uh, do you feel like Dirty Harry with a big 44 Magnum pointing it at the hotel industry? <laughs> um, I think that would probably be overstating it a little bit. Yeah, um, holding a gun to the head of an entire industry? Yeah, I think that, you know, I, I sort of, I think it's like the, the clear question to ask, like we offer accommodations for travel, Hotels offer accommodations for travel, so of course there's this feeling of some sort of conflict or competition between the two. I actually don't really think about it that way because it assumes that travel is a zero-sum game, and I actually don't think that it is. I think that Airbnb is expanding the travel category. I think we're getting more people to travel in different ways. Our business is growing very fast. Hotels business are gro is growing every single year, so I think that, you know, whether there are some competitive aspects to it, I guess. I don't really view it as like a direct competition with hotels. Well, certainly, sp speaking of somebody who's using an Airbnb in Barcelona because they couldn't get a hotel room, uh, it's fantastic. That's great. Um, but, uh, I, mean, I mean, also, just quickly, just briefly, I mean, there was, uh, in the early days of Airbnb, there were a few uh, uh, scandals, people having their entire apartments taken away and things like that. The safety issue uh, yeah. and tracking users uh, which is obviously something that you're very intimately involved with to try and make sure that we don't get any uh, criminals involved into the network. Um, what are the, some of the kind of technical ways that you can prevent that from happening? Yeah, of course. So, I mean, I guess depending on how you look at it, you could say that trust and identity is one of the core inventions or innovations that Airbnb came up with originally, right? Um, you know, you're going to meet somebody out there uh, to stay either with them or in, in where they live. There has to be a huge amount of trust involved in that. And so it's been a major area of investment for us uh, pretty much since the beginning. Some of the things that we do um, are things that you can actually see on the site, right? We, you know, you upload profile photos. We connect people with social networks, so we have some social proof that they're real. Um, we have this thing uh, where we can I verify people's identity. You can actually scan your driver's license and your passport, and then you'll get a badge on the site that you actually have a verified ID. So those are things that we can do sort of right at the outset to assure identity of somebody. Then beyond that, we have the review system, which is like a reputation system, right? So as you travel more or as you host more on Airbnb, you get more positive reviews. It's more proof that you're somebody who's a very good actor in our system. So those are the, those are like the things that you see, right? There's also plenty of stuff that happens behind the scenes as well to make sure that we're managing the community the way, the way we want to. Um, an example is we actually, every single booking, 
we apply a, a machine learned model to it that is basically a prediction of do we think that there's anything fishy about this booking or does this look like completely legit? There's tons and tons of signals that we looked, looked through uh, for that to get that sort of probability score. And if it scores over a certain threshold, then we'll review it, right? We'll actually go take a look and make sure this is something that we want. Another thing is that we, in a completely anonymous way, but we have algorithms that look at messaging patterns on the site. So if we see that you know, like one account or one block of accounts has sent thousands of messages out, then that raises a flag that this could be like a phishing attempt or something like that. Part of what we're doing in general, in all technology at Airbnb, is really about creating matches between people, right? You're matching a guest and a host together for an offline experience. A big part of that is making sure that the wrong matches can't happen, so that's why we invest so much in trust and identity. How important is Europe to Airbnb? Europe is huge. It's huge. Um, we, uh, let's see, I guess more than 50% of all bookings on Airbnb come from Europe, so it's our biggest market by far. It's growing Outside very fast. Outside of the US? Oh, it's bigger than the U.S. Yeah, Europe is a bigger, a bigger market than the U.S. Um, on the whole. So extremely, extremely important for us. Um, it's also something where we see uh, you know, a huge amount of travel between the U.S. and Europe, which I think is why um, Europe took off so quickly. The, the network effects of the business are so powerful. Like somebody goes, let's say, from Paris, stays in New York, stays with a host, has a great time on Airbnb. There's a high likelihood that they're going to go back to Paris and they'll either tell their friends or maybe they'll become a host themselves. So there's lots of opportunity for network effects um, to fuel the business. That's actually a lot of ways how we got started in Europe. Did, did you find that the, the, the rise of the clones, such as Wimdu, et cetera, uh, have yeah. a, a positive or a negative effect? Mm. Wimdu was a pretty amazing story. Th this is before my time at Airbnb, but I hear the stories about it. You imagine. You know, your company's doing really well, things seem like they're great, and then suddenly out of nowhere this, this company pops up and says, we've raised $100 million to compete directly with you and like, we're going to go uh, you know, crush your business. Uh, it was a very intense time from what I've heard. I think in the end it was good for us because it sort of lit a fire under, we have to get in front of this problem. We've got you know, a, a strong competitor, like somebody who's done this successfully before, and that was when we started opening our offices around the world, uh, particularly in Europe, where we got much more involved on the ground. And I think that that, that helped to ultimately propel us forward. So I think a little, a little competition can be a really good thing. You're also um, expanding in, in Dublin, I gather. Yeah, we have, uh, you know, our European headquarters is in, is in Dublin. And uh, I think that we're hiring, I think we just announced that we're going to hire about 200 more people there. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, it's, a, it's a multifunctional office. There's also a lot of customer care in that office. Customer care obviously is a big part of what we do. People are traveling in the world, they need somebody to contact, and Dublin's a center for that. But I'm presuming that engineering is staying in the States. At least for now, yeah. Our engineering team is in uh, San Francisco right now. I think that we'll see over the next couple of years, we'll probably start distributing that more globally. But while the team is still relatively small, it's kind of nice to have it in one location. Um, what about um, Asia? Because I know that, I happen to know that you've just come back from Asia, uh, to, directly to here. Right, last um, night. Is that, uh, I mean, how much, how, how big is in Asia an opportunity for you right now? Um, it must be pretty big, because I think a couple of years ago, you. You said uh, Airbnb made an, a, a little statement saying that it was going to be possibly the biggest market it, it had. Yeah, well, I mean, if you look, Asia is a huge potential market for us. Um, and we're, we're investing a lot in figuring out what works there and, and what doesn't right now. You mentioned I just came back from Singapore uh, last night. Actually, I was over there for a week um, learning more about the market. Uh, Asia is, for a total share of our business, relatively small today. But when you look at the potential and the amount of travel that's happening in Asia, it's completely massive. So this could be a really, really big uh, market for us. Um, we, are, we have a huge amount of traction in several uh, countries in Asia, and other ones are a little bit more latent and starting to grow right now. But if you think about the number of people, and also the fact that there's this whole rising group of relatively young people who are much more interested in international travel these days, the opportunity is, is really huge. And I think we could capture the imagination of a lot of those young travelers to travel with Airbnb in a way that they really connect with the local um, areas that they're visiting, as opposed to getting sort of a more prepackaged experience. So I think uh, Airbnb could, could be a great, uh, great way for them to do that. Um, 
I was um, reading up about some of the things that you've been talking about in the, in the past, and you're, you're a big data fan, for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people here, especially the entrepreneurs, would like to know more about that. Perhaps if you could unpack um, some of your thoughts. You've been, um, uh, I mean, we talk about big data, uh, we talk about the share economy. Uh, what does that m mean in, in, in terms of a startup when it's trying to sort of coalesce the amount of data it can draw on, both on users, on uh, revenues, and projecting into the future? Um, what are some of the things that you're sort of pioneering? At sure. I, I think that I, I talked about this a, a minute ago, but when, when I think about everything that we're doing in technology at Airbnb, the real point behind all of it is creating a match between two people online who are ultimately going to go have an offline experience, right? Like a, a stay experience. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when people think about, you know, ultimately what is our product, they think less about the mobile apps and the website, and they think about the place that they stayed or the host that they met. And so when I think about data and technology, it's really about how do we find the right matches between people, especially in an environment where you know, all of our supply is unique, all of our hosts are unique. What's right for one guest might, might not be right for another. I think that what we can do is use data to help find those best matches. I can give you an example of, of something that we, that we did last year. Mm. So we, we ran a predictive analysis um, on a whole group of hosts, figuring out which hosts were more likely to accept a reservation that was for tomorrow night or the night after, like basically very near term, versus which ones were more likely to accept a reservation two weeks or three weeks out, right? Who wanted more advance notice versus who wanted to fill their calendar short term? And we were able to use that um, prediction score on each host to be, able to, say, to be able to personalize the search results for people when they're searching depending on when they're planning to travel, right? So we're able to actually start personalizing the search results catered to what your specific travel needs are. That's like one small example of how you can use data to like personalize the matching problem. I think that um, there's lots more examples like it. Another one that I think has been really exciting is we think about all the people traveling on Airbnb. We have incredible information about just what, what typical travel patterns are, right? And so we came up with um, an algorithm last year that we've started using to uh, to make recommendations for where you should go. And we say for any point of origin, any city of origin, for any duration of stay outside of that point of origin, what are the high probability areas where people want to go on that trip based on previous travel data? And out of that, we can turn that into recommendations. So right. if you're interested in going away on a weekend stay or something, and you're going from San Francisco to somewhere else, I can say with pretty high probability what the top two or three destinations where you might want to be are. And of course, for San Francisco, I would understand that, but we can run the same type type of analysis on a city like Barcelona or anywhere else and be able to come up with great recommendations that help inspire travel. That data is very, very valuable though, isn't it? I think so, yeah. 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 Um, that, I'm going to talk about value in a second. Um, <laughs> what are some of, I mean, you, you're obviously an observer of, of technology trends yourself. You, I hope you read TechCrunch. Um, uh, what are some of the hot trends that really interest you personally? What are the things that you're, you know, you you find fascinating? Yeah, I think um, you like, you're a hardware guy. You like mobiles. You like uh, well, we, here we are at Mobile World Congress. Um, do you like uh, do you like drones? Do you like apps? What are you, what are you into? Big fan of drones. Uh, big fan of apps. I, I guess like I tend I tend not to think as much about that question in terms of like, you know, what are new programming languages or frameworks or things like that, and more like what kind of companies and what types of problems is our industry trying to solve? And I think right. that one of, the, one of the interesting trends that I see in the industry now, yeah. and that I hope continues, is really you're seeing more companies coming up that are really about connecting people to the physical world as opposed to just trying to create something that draws them into their screen all day. Right. You know, like it's not always about just like gluing you to that mobile device or gluing you to the website. More and more we're seeing companies come up where, you know, you're connecting people online to something that they're going to do offline in the world. And that I think is, is a really interesting trend because for a long time, you know, we've all been very, very glued to our screens. There's a lot going out there in the world. And I think that great, um, technology can actually connect us to that in a more meaningful way. Um, 
Now, so um, one thing I do want to ask you now, given, given talking about value just briefly uh, for a second, is uh, obviously TechCrunch recently has been reporting that uh, you guys are possibly raising a billion dollar round, which mm. would value you at uh, $20 billion. Interesting. I, I read that article too. You read that article too. <laughs> um, do you have any comment about that? <laughs> well, obviously, that's something I can't comment on. We're always looking at new opportunities. Um, I read the article too. Boy, that would be exciting. You'd be, but you'd be. If that was notionally true, then you'd be excited by that. Sure. Why not? But I obviously, it, I can't comment it, on it. Is it true? I can't comment on it. You're, you're, you're positive? I'm positive that you, I cannot you, comment on it. You're positive. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to speculate. It's all, it's all rumor and speculation right now. That's your comment? Yes. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> Thank you for asking, though. No, no, you're <laughs> welcome. Um, do, you think that you could, uh, do you think you could actually raise a billion dollars? I believe that we could raise a billion dollars if we wanted to. You could, yep. if you wanted to. Got it. Like that would put you up against, you'd, you'd be Snapchat, Airbnb. I mean, just generally, um, do you think it's sustainable that companies can get to these valuations and maintain these valuations for, for a long time? Uh, I mean, do you think globally that, that we're on a sort of a, a seismic shift towards entirely new valuation levels? I mean, I think that there's, um, we're seeing companies you know, seeing a lot of benefit to staying private for longer, which I think gives more opportunity for valuations to rise mm. uh, over time. I think the other thing that we're seeing is that where in a lot of previous times when you've seen really inflated valuations, there was not a lot of revenue <laughs> behind those valuations. Dot com bubble, that's it. Yeah, that, that seems to be changing now. I mean, I think that the revenue model behind some of the companies that are commanding really high valuation, uh, really va high valuations right now are much more sustainable, like there's a much clearer business model behind it. Um, you know, the valuations are still very high. You have to believe that the company is going to be able to grow to actually uh, match that valuation over time. But I think that the business fundamentals are much stronger than what we've seen in, uh, in previous rounds of, very, of companies with very high valuations. And, and so therefore, uh, it's, it's, we're in a different time now. You, you know, obviously you guys are booking incredible revenues and, and you're raising money on the back of, of those revenues. Well, that, that's the idea, yeah. I, mean, I think that it's dangerous to raise a bunch of money when you don't have a sense of how you're actually going to build the revenue behind it. So, um, so we're trying to do it based on a, on a strong business. Where's the, where does the future lie then for Airbnb? Um, uh, is it uh, in, in, in other kinds of businesses extending the business model into new and bigger features? Uh, what, what, what sort of kinds of things are you thinking about? Well, I think that long term, let, let, me, let me talk about it this way. I think that we have all taken trips out there where you've, you know, you've visited a new city and you've stayed in a hotel and you ate at the hotel bar and you went and caught, saw a couple sites and then you came back and stayed at the hotel bar and then you went home and then you thought you saw the place. But the fact is, you didn't really see the place. You didn't really connect with that environment. And I think what Airbnb aspires to do is to say that when you leave for a trip on Airbnb, the journey doesn't end when you get home. It changes you somehow. Like, it actually connects you to a local environment and to a local place and somehow transforms you. In order to do that, I think that we are going to have to get beyond just core accommodations. We're going to have to start thinking about the things that you do on your trip, who you're going to connect with, and how you're really going to experience a local environment. And so I think over the next few years, you're going to start seeing Airbnb getting into that area more, where when you book a place on Airbnb, you're not just booking the place you're going to sleep, but you're booking a trip. It sounds to me like you're going to get into the tour operator business. Well, we're not, we're not planning any tour buses yet. Right. <laughs> um, I think it's more about um, who you're going to meet what neighborhoods you're going to stay in, where you're going to go when you're there, like what kind of experience you're going to have that actually connects you to the destination that you're in and gets you feeling like you belong there. Like the mission of Airbnb, you've probably heard, is to enable a world where you can belong anywhere, which is a pretty lofty vision, right? Seven billion people belonging anywhere. Um, for everybody, belonging means different things. And when you travel to a new city on Airbnb, we want, it, you, we want you not to feel like an outsider. We want you to feel like it's somewhere where you can be 
uh, comfortable and at home and where you can really connect to the local culture. And I think there's a ton of things that we can do to make that possible over the next few years. Could you acquire Yelp, for instance? Uh, I'd have to think about how much Yelp would cost before I could answer that. <laughs> um, acquisitions could be part of it, definitely. I think that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of companies that uh, could be interesting for us to either integrate with in a partnership or, or possibly acquire over the years. I don't have any of those like on the immediate radar, though. Well, it's been a fascinating journey, Mike, and I really uh, hope that we can maybe come back in a, a year or so and uh, have another conversation about uh, how much money you raised. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Mike, thanks, thanks very so much. much. Thanks very much. Thanks. Cheers. Okay. See you later.